If you want to have your fingerprints taken too, you can meet with Dave after church. <laughs> and he'll be glad to, to print you real quickly. Um, during the message today, I'll, uh, I'll make reference and ask you to read along uh, to a couple of short parts in this booklet. So hopefully you got one of these. If not, I have some extras. Anybody need one? Oh, Steve, good job getting it, everybody. Uh, that was in Jerry's one. So. Jerry. Oh, Jerry. Okay. <laughs> Jerry, and it was teamwork. It was teamwork. Fantastic. Well, yeah, I mentioned earlier, uh, yeah, this booklet is Luther's Small Catechism. And if you are familiar with a much longer version, the, the expanded pieces of that Small Catechism actually isn't what Martin Luther wrote. Uh, there, it's really helpful sometimes, the question and answers, but in a very simple way, this is the book that Luther wrote for parents to teach to their children. Uh, so, um, so parents, if, uh, or grandparents, if the job seemed daunting before, maybe this simplifies it. Uh, but we'll, we'll make reference because we're in a new series. You noticed, uh, hopefully from your bulletin covers, uh, this idea of roots. Uh, we'll have to, uh, I want to spend some time on that. And... Uh, Andy, would you skip ahead to the message portion? I'm sorry, I must. I, I know I added the, the reading at the end. I forgot to add it or remove it from the beginning. We're, we're going to do the message text at the end of the message today, so we'll get to it. Um, but I made that change after we had printed bulletins. Um, but we're in this series, Roots, and really what I want to do over a series of Sundays is to uh, look at some of the portions of that catechism uh, that many of you uh, studied as middle school or junior high students and some maybe further down the road. Uh, but it's a good place to go back to because those sections of the catechism were chosen uh, because they, uh, they give us a good grounding. They, they really help us think about the roots of our faith, uh, the foundational pieces, uh, drawing on God's word and, uh, and our practice as God's people, uh, the things that we remind ourselves of. So we'll spend some time with that. Um, you'll notice this... You know, if we do a, several Sundays in a row here, this is going to carry us through the Lenten season. Today, however, is not Lent. That's why we've had several songs with hallelujahs in them. We're kind of getting them out of our system, you might say. Um, or we're, we're celebrating and using that term while we can, well, before we set it aside for the season of Lent. Uh, with this Wednesday being Ash Wednesday, uh, we'll enter into the Lenten season. But today's topic, I'll say, is fitting for Transfiguration Sunday as well. Because today I want to start... Uh, by looking at the Apostles' Creed. And I would say that seeing Jesus clearly changes our perspective on the world that we live in, which is part of the transfiguration. Hearing the voice of God declaring that Jesus is his own son affects how we see ourselves. And the truth, the truth of who Jesus is and, and what it means that God has come to us, it, it shapes our worldview. And I would suggest that the Apostles' Creed, among many other things, shapes our worldview. It reminds us how we see the world. Now, worldview um, is a confusing term. It sounds really big and ambiguous and hard to get a handle on. And in many ways, it's as simple as a perspective on the world that we live in. But there are many worldviews. Uh, there are many philosophies, if you will, of how the world works. Uh, we can talk about a Christian worldview, but a worldview can also be shaped by other things. And so uh, you can have different religious worldviews. Uh, someone can take a more scientific worldview and say, well, you know, the way I see the world all lines up with what I observe and what I, what I know through experiments uh, or, or that kind of thing. Um, but I came across recently a, a pretty simple definition of worldview, uh, and, and I think it's helpful in unpacking and understanding what we mean when we talk about worldview, when we talk about maybe even competing worldviews. Uh, worldview really comes down to four different questions. Every worldview tries to answer each of these questions in its own way. Who am I? Question of identity. Where am I? So am I in a world that was intentionally created and put together? Or am I in, am I in a place that just sort of happened to, to come about? What's the problem? Because quite honestly, any worldview that says everything is perfect is, uh, is pretty quickly thrown aside. 
Uh, it's easy to recognize that there are problems, there are challenges, there are, there, there are things broken in our world and in our lives. And finally, what's the solution? The Apostles' Creed, for us as followers of Jesus and those who know the, the truth of, of what God has revealed to us, of who He is and, and how this world is put together, who we are as His people, the, the truth laid out in that ancient creed help point us to answers to these questions. It helps shape our worldview as God's people. And so, with that kind of context, I want us to walk through parts of the creed today and a little bit of uh, Martin Luther's explanation, his expansions on, you know, when we say this part of the creed, what should it remind us of? What should it, what should it point us to in the way of a worldview? So I want you to turn on your little books here. If you look at page six, that's where the creed comes in. And the first article of the creed, the bold text says, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. What does this mean? Would you read with me the rest of that explanation? I believe that God has made me and all creatures, that he has given me my body and soul, eyes, ears, and all my members, my reason and all my senses, and still takes care of them. He also gives me clothing and shoes, food and drink, house and home, wife and children, land, animals, and all I have. He richly and daily provides me with all that I need to support this body and life. He defends me against all danger and guards and protects me from all evil. All of this he does only out of fatherly divine goodness and mercy, without any merit or worthiness in me. For all this it is my duty to thank and praise, serve and obey him. This is most certainly true. So, as you read those words, as we think about this idea of world and what the creed points us to, how does it answer the question? Who am I? I'm a created being. I'm intentional. I, I didn't come by accident, and, and I'm not a byproduct of something else. I'm cared for. I'm known by God. And I'm safe. He guards and protects me. Where am I? I'm in the place that was created for me. I'm in the place that was, that was put together so that, so that I could be here, so that we could be here. I'm, in that sense, I'm home. But what's the problem? Well, even as we lay out in that, in that explanation that God provides all that I need, I realize that there are people whose needs go unmet, right? And sometimes it's hard to see God's presence. And sometimes danger and evil affect me and affect other people in this world. And it, and it raises the question, even as we read those words of what our God does for us, did God fail? Is he, is he not living up to this? This week I talked to uh, a young lady named, uh, we'll, we'll call her Cynthia, and she was telling me the story of what's happened in her family over the last year or two. Um, her mom left, left her dad on her way out, just the snippets that she shared with me, uh, every room in the house was trashed because his mom was taking all the things that belonged to, to her. Um, her dad had been previously married, so, so Cynthia has a, a stepsister. Uh, and, and, and for the last 15 years, uh, Cynthia's mom had been mom to her stepsister as well. But, but on mom's way out, she told the stepsister or stepdaughter to her that you were never my daughter anyway. It's really hurtful things happen there. And whether something like that's happened to us or happened to people that we know, sometimes it's hard to see God guarding and protecting. And so we recognize that there definitely are problems. So what's the solution? Well, I think the easiest way to see that to actually move on and create and to continue this confession. We read the second article earlier. We read it as part of our confession and absolution this morning, or at least a, a large portion of it. 
can remember, you can remember the part of the creed, and we'll say it together in a little bit. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence He will come to judge the living and the dead. So who am I according to this, this set of words? Well, I'm, as Luther would say, if you look through the explanation, I'm, I'm lost and condemned. I'm a sinner. I'm dying. But I'm also, I'm also redeemed. I've been purchased. And the price of, of something that's been purchased reveals the value. You remember that story that Jesus told? The, the merchant who finds this pearl that's, that's worth more than anything he could, he could ever imagine? And so he sells everything that he has in order that he could buy that one item. It's a picture of what, what your God has done for you. It's a picture of what he's done for you in Jesus. It's a picture that, that's being laid out in those words of the, the second article. Not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood and his innocent suffering and death. And so, you're a prize because you've been purchased and won. And where are you? You're in his kingdom. <laughs> that last part, so that I could live with him in his kingdom. That's, that's not something that comes down the road, that's something that is now. You've been purchased and won, you've been redeemed, you've been brought into this thing, you are a part of God's kingdom. You're a part of it right now, right here and now. And all these other pieces and the, the, the problem that we identified, that fades away. But his kingdom endures. And your life in that kingdom has already begun. And there's more. There's, there's more to this, this worldview as we unpack it. We jump ahead to the, to the third article, right? That's on page 8. And I want to read the bold part for you. I believe in the Holy Spirit... The Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. And would you read with me the next section? What does this mean? I believe that I cannot, by my own reason or strength, believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to Him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with His gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. In the same way, he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. In this Christian church, he daily and richly forgives all my sins and the sins of all believers. On the last day, he will raise me and all the dead and give eternal life to me and all believers in Christ. This is most certainly true. So who are you according to that? Well, you are the church. You are the very body of Christ. You're a witness. You're a witness on, on mission and in action for your Lord. You're, you're a part of creation which has been restored and now brings this restoration to the rest of the creation around you. And where are you? Well, you're within the communion of saints. You're in this family. You're, you're placed into this, this community and this body. You're in this world, but you're supported by a God who's beyond this world. And you're in the here and now, which is different from some other worldviews that, that, that believe that you exist only for something else or that, or that the really good stuff is, is situated outside of what we can see, think, or feel. You're here and now in this place, and your God is with you, and his people are with you, and you're already part of his kingdom, and you're already a part of his work, and that's moving, and that situates you, it, it gives you a place, it, it tells you, it orients you to, to where you are and where you're going as well, and what's the problem? The problem, you just read it, right? I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him. And that's the real problem. That's the, because all these things that are true and all these things that are good that we're talking about, they're true because of our faith in Christ. And we know them by this faith that we have, but I can't make myself believe. 
I can't, I can't come to Christ, I can't believe in Him on my own. And that is the real problem. So what's the solution? God comes to you. That's the solution. God came into this world in the person of His Son, Jesus, to live and to die. And He rose again. And He sent His Holy Spirit to dwell in you, to be present with you in His work in this world. God moves into this world through you. What does that look like? I mean, how does this, how does this really play out? Well, sometimes it looks like just spending time with someone who's new, with someone who feels out of place. Maybe it means sitting by them. Sometimes it looks like asking your neighbor how they're doing and then asking them to tell you more and listening to what they have to say. Sometimes, sometimes it looks like praying for somebody. Praying for someone that you care about. And then connecting with them so that you can listen. So that you can pray some more. And connecting and listening and praying and connecting and listening and allowing that listening to shape how you pray for that person and for so many others. Sometimes it looks like um, Elizabeth, who at the event I was at this past week, she, uh, she had an opportunity, we, we broke up into these groups of three and we shared prayer requests and we prayed for one another and, and somebody at the conference actually placed, placed a hand on Elizabeth's shoulder after hearing her prayer request and, and, and prayed for her with, with a hand on shoulder and they got done and Elizabeth said, she, she said, my eyes are, I, I'm kind of starting to cry because no one's ever prayed for me before. This is what it looks like. This is what it looks like for God to work in His people and through His people. That's that's part of our part of our worldview. This this belief that that God is present with me in this world, that that there are problems in this world, but my God is working working to, to solve those problems, to fix those problems. That He's begun in me, He's begun in you, and He, and he wants to continue that work for others through me and you. That's, that's part of what we confess, and that's part of what we believe, and it's part of who we are, because, because it's true. Because it's what God has shown us in His work, in His Son. So you know you're God. And that shapes your view of all things. It shapes who you are. It shapes your understanding of where you are. And you, and you know the problems, but you also know the solution, and you get to share that solution. And that's stands at the, root, the roots of our faith and what we believe. Now, I, I told you we would have the reading at the end today, the, the message text. And as I read from the first chapter of Ephesians, I want you to listen for the references, references to God the Father, to God the Son, and to God the Holy Spirit. I want you to notice the one who shapes your worldview. Notice the place that you have as well in his plans, in his work, and in relationship with him. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the Beloved. In Him, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished on us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of His will, 
according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you please stand as we confess this faith that we share, this faith that